So I hope you can all hear me. Yeah. Um, so um, uh, this talk is entitled Non-Commutative Worlds. And uh, let me explain what that is by starting the talk. Um, uh, one of the motivations for this is a uh, derivation of electromagnetism or the formalism of electromagnetism from commutators that's due to Feynman and was uh, publicized by Freeman Dyson around 1991. Um, and what uh, Feynman did was he said, let's suppose that you have uh, three variables uh, which are non-commuting, so they're operators, and uh, they represent spatial point, um, three, three points in space, and uh, they commute with one another, and they have time derivatives, and, um, and you, we will assume that, the, so that's something like momentum, right? Um, and it's assumed that the, um, that the commutator of xi and xj dot is delta ij. Um, it's not assumed that the xj dots commute with one another. So if they are momentum, they're not the usual kind of momenta that you would see in quantum mechanics. Uh, and you define h, or b, as the non-commutative vector cross product of x dot with itself. So that actually is basically just the commutator of xi with xi dot with xj dot, but shifted by... Uh, some indices, all right? Um, and then you show, he shows, that um, if you define an E field by X double dot is equal to E plus X dot cross H, if you would define it by the usual formula, uh, then E and H will satisfy Maxwell's equations. You'll have the divergence of H is equal to zero. You'll have the rate of change, time rate of change of the ma a magnetic field is related to the curl of the electrical field. It will look like Maxwell's equations. Uh, the question is, what's going on here? Um, and uh, a long, long time ago, I got interested in this through talking with Pierre Noyes, who had a notion that it ought to be saying something about discrete physics. Uh, on the other hand, the way this derivation works uh, all the derivatives are given by commutators whenever they can be, not the x dot. The x dot is just given by some kind of time rate of change that's already there. But all the other derivatives that are involved here um, are done by commutator with a, something appropriate. And you see it's possible to do that when you have a situation like this because you have xi comma xj dot is the delta ij. So that means that if you took a function of xi's, and you put it in there, and you took uh, its commutator with an xj dot, it would appear to be being differentiated with respect to xj because of the delta ij, right? The derivative of xi with respect to xj should be delta ij. And so instead of differentiating, you take the commutator with xj dot. xj dot represents the derivative with respect to xi. That's how the derivatives work. Um, so that's the puzzle that was in, that's in the back of my mind here, and I will get to it um, if we have time. I may skip to it. But I want to go back and talk about discrete things and show you some of the ideas that came out by trying to think about this discreetly. So first of all, if you're thinking about a, a world that's uh, discrete, then position and velocity definitely don't commute. Um, and it's quite clear why they don't. Suppose you had a set of positions for an object at time, next time, next time, next time. So my multiple, uh, my apostrophes mean the next time. And you define velocity uh, to be equal to the difference between the value of x at the next time minus the value of x now. And I won't put in a delta t at the moment. I'll put in a delta t later. So that's the velocity, just that difference difference between next time and present time. Um, and then I will write ordered products, meaning ordered measurements, uh, and they are to be evaluated as products. So x, yes? Is there an error in the almost last line, no? What? There's an error. There's an error, error? Yes. or an arrow? Um, 
this is not an error. This is the way I intend to measure. I intend to measure x and then measure v. And here I mean to measure v and then what? You're reading too fast. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I'm reading too fast. Um, you can't ask me about an error that I haven't made yet. And I don't officially make the error until I read it off the slide, right? OK, so, so we have here a succession of time values. And the velocity is given by x prime minus x, so the difference. Uh, I'm writing in order in this way so that when I write, the, the rightmost thing means measure that first, then measure this, all right? So now, if you measure x, I'm going to assume that it didn't take you any, uh, any time. But if you measure velocity, it forces you to take time, so we have to allow the clock to tick. So measuring x and then measuring v is not going to be the same as measuring v and then measuring x. And we can write down, uh, as a result of this error, what the result would be. You measure x, you got it. You measure v, and you get x prime minus x. On the other hand, you measure v, and you have it, but the clock is ticked, and so what you pick up is x prime, not x, because the clock had ticked, OK? So I don't think that's an error. Was that the error you saw? Uh, or you thought it looked strange? It does look a little strange, but that's what happened, right? Because the clock has ticked. You're moving along. You were at x, and you measured x. But then you measured velocity, and now you're over here, and then you measured x, and so you got x prime. So take a moment to absorb that. That's sort of the main point here. Um, that if you're measuring discreetly, then uh, you'll be measuring. Uh, if, and if what you measure requires you to use time, then you'll be up along the sequence somewhere. And so you see that you get xv minus vx is equal to x prime minus x squared, assuming that all the x's commute. Of course, I could later think of x's that don't commute, but here I'm assuming they commute. So you get the square of the step that x took uh, for the commutator of those, and, um, and things don't commute. Is this like quantum mechanics or not? Well, let's play around with it. Um, so I want to play around with it and, um, and uh, point out something else. So let's define a, a difference operator. Does this thing work? I don't know where my dot is. Yeah, so here's, here's one. Maybe it's not working. Yeah. You got a brighter one? I've got something. Oh, good. Try this one. Uh, where's the button? Oh, oh that's nice. Okay, okay. Much better. OK. Yeah, so here's a difference operator. And I'm going to think of having more than one time series going. And then I'm going to, for, for mathematical definition, say that x, y at, at the next time is the product of x at the time, and x time and y at the next time. All right? That's natural enough. And then, um, and then if I apply the difference operator to the product, I do not get uh, the usual Leibniz rule. You can check this. This is just a general fact about, about taking a difference. The reason that this also, the reason the Leibniz rule is true in ordinary calculus is because x prime is infinitesimally close to x, and so gets to be ignored, and you're dividing by dt, or d a or whatever the variable was, you're getting f of x plus h minus f of x divided by h limit as h goes to zero. And there is no x prime available to you. It, it goes away in the limit. It doesn't exactly have to do with the thing, fact that things commute. Um, so, so we have that in this discrete difference operator. We have the next time. And um, so I'm going to define, uh, this is a little digression from what I did before, but I want you to see it first. I define delta x to be equal to j dx. So where j is uh, an operator which I have concocted, which has the property that when you slide it past the x, it causes the time to shift up by 1. Now, I need an operator like that if I'm going to describe what I was just describing to you on the previous slide. I need to have an operator that, which will be preserved, which will, which will tell me that something causes the clock to tick. You see? 
If you went back to the previous slide, you would see that there was a good reason for having such an operator because, oops, that's not the previous slide. Uh, because you see, this is not an algebra operation. I had to remember, if I replace V by this, then you would say, oh, well, and then x is x, and you wouldn't have an x prime, right? So I can't make ordinary substitutions in this algebra because of the time shifting. But if instead of having x prime minus x, I had replaced it by an operator j times x prime minus x that remembered to shift the time, and it remembers to shift the time by sliding across and causing the time to shift, then I'd be in good shape. So that's what I'm going to do here. I'm going to invent a little operator j, which has the property that when I slide it past x, it causes the time to shift up by 1. And then you'll notice that delta xy is j multiplied by j, right? You multiplied the d by j, and that's how you got it. So you multiply this by j. But then jx prime is xj. And you see this is delta x times y plus x delta y. So the moral of that is a, just a mathematician's moral, that if you were to add to discrete calculus an operator which shifted time in this way, you could say that the conjugation by j causes the next time to appear. j inverse xj is x prime. And you multiply the discrete difference operator by that non-commuting operator, then you get a new operator, delta, which satisfies the Leibniz rule. So you can... You can get the shift into the discrete calculus in that way. And then you see something else. You see that what you had done when you did that, multiplied by j, the difference, is you would get jx prime minus jx, but jx prime is xj. Are you used to that rule by now? Shifting j to the left causes the time to increase by 1. That's a commutator. So that the discrete derivative is a commutator in this extension of discrete calculus. Any discrete derivative can be viewed as a commutator. So that's part of uh, what we began to understand about that puzzle about the Dyson derivation to begin with, is that discrete derivatives can be thought of as commutators, or commutators can be thought of as discrete derivatives if you take this point of view. And so when you shift to a world where you're representing derivatives by taking commutators, you could say that you're shifting to a discrete world. Uh, so, on the other hand, um, I'm using x dot in this slide just for fun, um, and I still have xj is equal to jx prime, but x dot is the one that has been adjusted, all right? Um, and so the x dot is the one that is a commutator, but now I'm dividing by a delta t uh, for some time step involved, and then you see that it's still a commutator, and I divided by the delta t. And now we can see how this would work in the formalism that we were playing with. So now I have xj is jx prime, and the v has been replaced by j times x prime minus x over dt, and you get xv minus vx, and then, and then it's all algebraic. I just want to make it automatic, the same idea that I was using before. So I have xj x prime minus x over dt, and j times x prime minus x uh, times x over dt. Here the j is all the way to the left. Here it isn't all the way to the left, but when I push it to the left, we get the x prime, which is what we said before, only now it's happening in the algebra. And so this becomes j times x prime minus x squared over dt. Should have been a dt. Yeah? What? Yeah. We finally found a mistake on the slide. Um, uh, so the commutator of x with v, it's the same as before, except it has this, uh, this, this time cataloger on the left there. Um, and we get dx squared over dt. But when we put the dt in, we, we see that and, that, and that's a bit striking if you think about it. You're getting the square of the change of distance divided by the change in time. And uh, if you're used to that sort of thing from somewhere else, then you realize that it somehow must be a version of the diffusion equation. Because you have a particle which is changing by 
Suppose that this is equal to a constant. Then the particle would be changing by a constant step each time, possibly plus or minus because of the squaring. won't see it. It looks like a Brownian motion of a particle moving around. Um, and when you're studying the Brownian motion of a particle, say with equal probability, then you arrive at this constant. You should set dx squared over dt equal to a constant and let dx and dt go to zero, and you have the Brownian motion, which is satisfied by a diffusion equation. I won't go through the derivation of the diffusion equation, but that involves thinking about the probability of finding the particle. Here we haven't got probability involved, but the diffusion constant comes in in that way. I'll put it another way on, on the next slide. Um, I'm saying the same thing here, that x, um, x commutator with x dot will be j times some constant. The constant is equal to the square of the step divided by the time, and, uh, and the step would be plus or minus the square root of kt. And this is looking like the diffusion constant for that Brownian walk. So I think that's interesting in and of itself, in that if you start in this very elementary way, thinking about a particle moving in a, in a discrete framework, uh, then the commutator comes in. And setting that commutator equal to a constant uh, gives rise to the same sort of considerations that you would get by thinking about the diffusion equation and Brownian motion. So now I want to think about process in a more general way. So I'm thinking about uh, the following kind of thing. Um, I'm thinking about an elementary recursion, which I've represented here by uh, the next L is equal to the previous L with a box around it. So that if you went to the limit, um, you would have an infinite nest of boxes, which was invariant under one more box. But if you took it as a recursion, then you would be putting one more box each time like that. So it's a very elementary recursion. But when, you have an, when, you have, when you're thinking about a recursion, there are two ways of thinking, thinking about it. One is process, and the other is um, limit of the process. In this case, the limit of the process is purely spatial, an infinite nest of boxes, which is invariant under putting one more box around it. Um, so you can put various kinds of things into that framework and I want to put the square root of minus 1 into that framework. So in order to do that, I need to have a transformation like a box. And the transformation is going to be minus 1 over x. I should have written it on the slide. t of x is equal to minus 1 over x, all right? I would like a fixed point for t of x. t of x is minus 1 over x. Minus 1 over x equals x means that x squared equals minus 1. So if it has a fixed point, it would have to have square minus 1, assuming that it was like a number, some algebraic object. Um, so that's, that's how i is usually thought of as at the fixed point level. Uh, i is equal to minus 1 over i. But if you think of it as a process, then the process is t of x is minus 1 over x. And if you started with 1 and you put it into that transformation, you get minus 1 over 1, which is minus 1. And if you put minus 1 into the transformation, then you get minus 1 over minus 1, which is plus 1. And so it oscillates between plus 1 and minus 1. So the square root of minus 1 is associated with a very elementary process, which is just oscillating between plus and minus 1. And that process can be viewed in two ways. It can be viewed as going from minus 1 to plus 1 or going from plus 1 to minus 1. The next time version of the process is always the negative of the previous time. So in this case, the temporal shift is very simple. And you can think of the temporal shift as happening between this view and that view by uh, as this one is the temporal shift of that one. Change the signs. Minus 1 plus 1 is shifted to plus 1 minus 1 under one time step. So. If we applied the same idea that I was just using for a time series to that, then we would have an operator which I've called eta here. I called it j before. This applied to eta is eta applied to ba on the other side. ba is the one-step time shift of ab, minus 1 plus 1 to plus 1 minus 1. And I will have that eta squared is equal to 1 for simplicity here. So then 
I can also multiply these views of that simple process term by term. And then you'll see that I returns under this in the following way. If I define I to be equal to 1 minus 1 times eta, then you see that if you multiply them together, then you get, because of the time shifting, you can bring that eta across to the other side and change this to the other time, and then multiply them, and you get minus 1 minus 1, which is minus 1. And eta squared is 1, and so you get I times I is minus 1. By a combination of thinking of I as an oscillation between 1 and minus 1, and putting in the time shifting operator, which makes it time sensitive, so that it, get, it shifts with respect to itself when you multiply it by itself. It shifts with respect to itself when you multiply it by itself, so you don't get 1 minus 1 multiplied by 1 minus 1 and pick up 1, 1. You get 1 minus 1 multiplied by 1 mi minus 1 shifted, and then you get minus in both cases, and you get minus 1. So this is an interpretation of how you get back to the square root of minus 1 from the process way of looking at it by adding in this time shifting operator. So this is the same idea as what I was using before to reformulate derivatives, but now I'm just using it on the very simplest process I can, which is the one related to the square root of minus 1. Now, I want to make a, a, a digression here, but I think in the interest of time, I'm going to skip this digression completely. Pardon me, you'll see these slides go past. And there is something interesting to say there, but in the interests of time, we won't. So I'm back here, and uh, I have this way of thinking about I, um, and I've made I temporally sensitive in that way. Um, and this is the same formalism, so I'll skip that too. But I want to think of the following principle, which is a well-known principle in physics, not always expressed this way, uh, the principle is that, in the usual principle is that very often it's fruitful to take a time variable and replace it by i times the time variable. And if you're thinking in pure mathematical terms, you might wonder, well, why the heck would that be useful? Um, but if you're thinking in these quasi-physical terms, then it does make a certain kind of sense, because if you multiply by i, then you're multiplying by this already temporally sensitive entity which is coming from the simplest discrete process that you could imagine. So it's not, uh, it, 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 there's a certain interpretation there that isn't usually present when you do what's called a wick rotation, which is to formally multiply by i. Formally multiplying by i takes you from one context to another, like it takes you between a Euclidean context, x squared plus y squared plus z squared, into uh, plus t squared into the Minkowski context where you want minus t squared, for example. Um, it's um, almost mystical the way multiplying by i and replacing uh, t by i and replacing it shifts you from one context to another um, in, in elementary physics. So I'm, um, I'm adding a way of questioning that to the brew in that it seems that I is already time sensitive, and that has to do with why, when it's allied with T, something happens. Uh, now, let's go back again to the elementary mathematics of this. I want you to see that what I'm doing is actually well known to you um, in another context. What I was doing was I was saying, I will take a sequence like this, and I will Think of it as having vectors a, b, or b, a, depending on which way you look at them. And you add them coordinate-wise, and you multiply them coordinate-wise, which isn't what you usually do with vectors. And I have a permutation operator. Pardon me for keep shifting the language. But I have a permutation operator, which if I multiply on one side, I get the same as multiplying on the other side by the permutation applied to a, b. That's what happened, right? We, shift, we flipped it. Now, if you take a two-by-two two matrix, then you can write it as a diagonal matrix times an identity matrix plus a diagonal matrix times a permutation matrix. And so if I care to, I can take a two by two matrix and I can translate it into a vector AD multiplied by an identity operator plus a vector BC multiplied by a permutation operator. 
And it is certainly the case that if you interpret that way, that this is true. That if you multiply a diagonal matrix times the permutation operator, it's the same as multiplying the permutation operator times the flipped diagonal matrix. So that two by two matrix algebra is in fact represented by linear combinations of these iterants that I've been describing here, if you want to call them iterants because of the iteration, and that this operator corresponds to the anti-diagonal part of the matrix. And so we recover ordinary matrix algebra from this point of view, or we interpret it that way. And then, of course, also, um, that means that uh, the uh, interpretation of I itself as minus 1, 1 times P is the interpretation, well, put a minus 1 and a 1 in there and multiply the matrix if I didn't do it on my next slide, and you get the matrix minus 1, 1, which is a well-known way of representing I. It squares minus 1. And the reason it squares minus 1 is because the permutation causes the minus 1s and the 1s to interact when you multiply the matrix. Okay. Um, so we get matrix algebra written this way. And some, uh, this, this, this give, then gives you a way to think about some other uh, matrices that come up in physics. Uh, for example, this matrix is uh, a great favorite of mine and, and other people's, I think. You put time and space variables into a two by two matrix like this, t plus x, t minus x, y plus i z, and y minus i z, and you will see, that, for example, that t squared minus x squared minus y squared minus c squared is the determinant of that. Uh, and so you can think of that as a point in space-time and use it. Um, you can also rethink uh, what the meaning of this is in terms of the iterants, if you want to, by rewriting back into what I was just talking about. I'm not going to go into that. I just wanted to show it to you. Let's go back to discrete process now. So um, I'm writing it um, in the form x of t and delta t. And v of t is x at t plus delta t minus x at t divided by delta t. And then if we multiply by j, just as we did before, we would get this commutator. And, that, and now let's, let's turn it into a more physical language. So x is q, position. dx is momentum divided by mass. Okay, velocity is momentum divided by mass. Um, and, um, and I won't worry about the j because it evaluates to this as a scalar quantity, delta x squared over delta t. Um, and then we will replace d delta t by i delta t according to our principle of replacing t uh, by i t. And delta x squared over delta t has the units of h bar over m, where h bar is Planck's constant. So then this looks like q p over m is equal to minus i h bar over m, or pq commutator is equal to i h bar. This is an, another instance of the Wick rotation, Wick rotation, where replacing t by i t takes you from the context of Brownian motion and diffusion equation to the context of quantum mechanics. Um, only this is happening entirely at the quantum, at the um, commutator level. So this is the best answer I can give to, does this way of thinking discreetly lead to quantum mechanics? It will only lead to quantum mechanics in my way of thinking if you, if you somehow make the appropriate wick rotation, if you uh, make the appropriate uh, a substitution of time by I times time, and then it really does look like quantum mechanics. That's mysterious exactly at the point where you do that I, of course. But here you can look at this a little differently, and I don't know how far uh, I can eventually go with this, or you will. Remember, the I is a discrete process. So this is representing discrete processes, and there's another underlying discrete process, I, which is synchronized with everything else by the algebra. So there's a multiplicity of discrete processes that are being described in interrelationship by the Heisenberg formula. Now, again, I'm 
Um, all right. I'll say this, but quickly. I wanted to tell you how that iterant point of view um, of having the, uh, uh, the shifting operator works for higher dimensional matrix algebra, and it does, um, in the following sense. If you had a permutation matrix and you had a vector, which is diagonal, then you will have, uh, you, then you can uh, think of linear combinations of things like that. And then you will multiply them by having, when the permutation passes by the vector, it will cause the vector to be permuted in its coordinates by the permutation. And the, so you see that two entities of this type can multiply to give you another entity of this type. Any matrix is a sum of things like that. Any linear transformation is actually a sum of things of that type. So you can reformulate arbitrary matrix algebra or arbitrary linear algebra in this form. Um, in particular, for example, you can reformulate uh, the usual four by four representations of the quaternions in this form by choosing the right permutation matrices. You often see the, uh, this representation where you see a matrix which is sprinkled with ones and minus ones, and it's actually a permutation matrix with signs in those places. So it turns into a diagonal matrix times a permutation matrix, and that's one of the representations of the quaternions. We can then go on and look at Dirac algebra and other things in that form, but I'm going to do a little skipping at this point, so you don't need to see that, and we won't go on here. And I'll skip that. Pardon me for flashing this by you, but it's, um, it's for your own good not to have to see it. Uh, I did want to say a couple of things about the quaternions before I left this section of the talk. Um, because what I've just shown you is that you can get over to the quaternions and matrix algebra quite easily by thinking about elementary process in this way. But on the other hand, the quaternions are re directly related to spatial things. And, um, and then it's a little mysterious about what is the relationship between all that discrete process that I started to describe to you and the kind of spatial things that the quaternions are related to. So the quaternions are related to um, the fact that if I take a belt and I twist it by 720 degrees and have it attached to, say, the ceiling of the room and uh, a ball hanging from the, uh, from the ceiling like this, and I can push the belt around the ball, and it will come back, and the 720 degrees of twist will be gone. I'm saying this now, and I'll illustrate it in a moment. If you rotate only by 360 degrees and you have the belt, it will come back rotated in the opposite direction by 360. A rotation by 360 looks like a minus 1, in that if you do it twice and do 720, it goes away completely. The quaternions then live in that relationship between an object and its surroundings attached by a belt or strings to the surroundings. So for example, if I take a 180 degree rotation to mean I around the axis pointing out of my body, that's I, and I take J to be a 180 degree rotation along the axis parallel to my body, and I take, say that wrong, I, yeah, sorry, um, I want J to be a rotation around the axis by 180 degrees perpendicular to my body, and K to be the rotation around the axis parallel to my body. Then if I do I and I do J, each 180 degrees, I did the same thing as doing K. So already in your hands you have I times J is equal to K. But if you did I squared, your arm would be twisted by 360 degrees. So you're not back where you started. Um, but, if, but on the other hand, if you twisted it by 720 degrees, you'd be broken. But if it was a belt or something more flexible, then you could undo it completely, as the illustration will show, or it does show there if you're looking at that. Um, so, so if I do I, and then I do J, and then I do K, I also get 360 degrees. So what I've illustrated here is that I times J times K is minus 1, 360 degrees, and that I squared is minus 1, and J squared is minus 1, and K squared is minus 1. So the quaternions are in your hands in that sense, in the relationship between your hand and the surround or the wall. So 
Um, you can illustrate all that with a little band and, uh, and an object which has been attached like that. And we can illustrate the belt trick with a short movie. We have just enough time for that, to do that. This is a movie we made many years ago. Dan Sandine and uh, George Francis and myself and people at the Electronic Visualization Lab. But my question is, what does all this geometry have to do with all that discrete process that I was telling you before? I don't know. I've jumped into another domain here. Oh, this one is illustrating this, that you can rotate your arm, uh, keeping your hand flat and uh, by 720 degrees, and you come back to where you started because of a kind of over-under. But it's the same geometry as the fact that 720 degrees will cancel out, which will be illustrated in a moment. But first, there's a human being who will be illustrating what I just did. There she is. So you see, her, those cups are always vertical, or approximately vertical, and they go through 720 degrees of rotation and come back with no twist. And here is the belt and the ball and the ceiling. And as it goes around and comes back up, it's 720 and then back to nothing. And you can orchestrate that so that it happens in parallel to a whole bunch of belts or strands. Okay, that was part one, but part one is about two-thirds of the talk, so let's go on. I want to talk about how to orchestrate um, advanced calculus uh, with uh, these derivatives. So to, uh, to orchestrate advanced calculus means to have more than one variable and to have um, lots of commutators around to represent each derivatives with respect to all the different variables. So. Um, so I'm going to work in an abstract algebra. I'm going to have a commutator available, um, and I will write delta sub n of f to be f commutator n, the derivative in the, uh, represented by n. And then, of course, since commutators are what they are, these all satisfy the Leibniz rule, and it looks like calculus. And, um, and then you will see that... Um, this is, this is a kind of primitive version of curvature without some of the usual terms uh, because I'm only concerned with what happens if I apply one derivative and then I apply another or I do it in the opposite order. I want the commutator of the derivatives and I'll call that curvature and you might want, to add, you might want me to add the other extra terms that are usually there. We could try to do that but I'm just doing that and then you will see easily enough that if you have delta i is represented by n sub i and delta j is represented by n sub j, each is a commutator with respect to that, and you look at delta i times delta j applied to f minus delta j delta i applied to f, it's the same as the commutator of the representors applied to f, commutator with f. Um, it's an easy piece of algebra. But that means you can measure how things behave um, in different orders by looking at the way the things that represent them behave. It means that if you wanted derivatives to commute, for example, you could do it by making sure that this was in the center of the algebra, or you could make it even more elementary by just assuming that these commuted with one another, and then the derivatives would have to commute. So with that in mind, I won't do the derivation. Let's do advanced calculus. So what will advanced calculus look like? Advanced calculus will look like this. We have x coordinates xi, x1 through xn, and we have um, some pi's, and the pi's represent derivative with respect to xi, delta ij. Okay. Um, and 
I'm going to assume that the pi's commute with one another. That makes sure that all the basic derivatives d by dxi commute with one another. So this is uh, ordinary advanced calculus in a flat space. Uh, and I have di of f is the derivative of f with respect to xi. And I have di hat of f will be the derivative of f with respect to pi, which will be the commutator of f with respect to xi. This is symmetric, the way I have set it up. So you can think of this as a derivative of with respect to pj by taking the commutator with respect to xi. Either way, they both work. Um, and I have both of those derivatives, the derivative with respect to the momenta, if you like, and the derivative with respect to the positions. And then we want to be able to model physical processes, so we should have also a derivative with respect to time, and that will be given by another guy called h with malice aforethought. All right? So commutator with h gives you the derivative with respect to time. And then among other things, you see that Hamilton's equations are built in here. I'm doing this in one variable. I have a q and a p, uh, which commutator to one, commute to one. Um, I have f dot is fh. df dq is the commutator of f with p. df dp is the commutator of q with f. p dot is ph, which is minus hp, which is equal to minus dh dq by definition. And q dot is equal to qh, which is dh dp. And that's Hamilton's equations. q dot is dh dp and p dot is minus dh dq. Um, it works just as well in as many variables as I care to write down. So in this framework for advanced calculus, Hamilton's equations are part of the mathematical framework, and they don't become physical until you know what kind of an h causes the derivative with respect to time. And of course, that has to do with energy and the physical situation. That's the Hamiltonian in the physics. Um, that repeats what I just said. Um, what about general equations of motion? What will they look like? Well, you would have these xi's, and you would have their derivatives with respect to time should be some other elements in the algebra, all right? And um, in order to get a picture of what that would look like, let me write them in reference to the pi's which are given. And then this looks familiar to you if you're used to mathematical physics. The reference I wrote is an ai because uh, that's the way it is often written but not usually in this context. If we put that in, then we would have, we would we want to look at what I called curvature, the way the operators don't commute with one another, the way their representors don't commute with one another. And those are pi minus ai and pj minus aj. And you multiply that out, and you get the ith derivative of aj minus the jth derivative of ai plus the commutator of ai aj, which is a well-known curvature expression. That's the curvature of a gauge field if the AIs are interpreted as the gauge field. So in this version, in this vignette of doing advanced calculus by using commutators, you arrive at Hamilton's equations and the notion of the curvature of the gauge field in an abstract form immediately uh, in the first lesson, right? Uh, that's kind of amusing. Uh, and uh, for the last four minutes, let's look at how the generalized Dyson derivation looks. Um, now, there are different ways you can go from here, and I'm going back to the Dyson derivation, the, the Feynman Dyson derivation. Um, I'm using a B for the field, x dot, just like we said before, but I'm going to do something a little different with the E. I'm going to define E to be the time derivative, partial time derivative of the x dot, okay? And I'm telling you now what the non-commutative vector cross product is. Vector cross product is often defined by epsilon i, j, k, right? Epsilon i, j, k means 1 or minus 1 or 0. Epsilon 1, 2, 3 is 1. If you do a transposition, it becomes minus 1. It's the sign of a permutation of three things. And if two of them are equal, it's 0. That's epsilon. So then you can define the vector cross product by using the epsilons, the zeros and the ones of the epsilon, and the coordinates of the vectors. But ai and bj don't commute with one another in general. So uh, that's 
why this is a non-commutative vector cross product. And it could even happen that A cross A is non-zero in such a situation, because AI and AJ don't commute. Um, and then we'll see that E and B satisfy a generalization of Maxwell's equations. Now, all derivatives are represented by commutators, and I'm going to represent the derivative with respect to x as commutator with the xi dot. You'll see in a second. Um, that, means, that means that since these don't commute with one another, then I'm actually using covariant derivatives. I'm not using ordinary derivatives anymore. Um, I'm using covariant derivatives. Actually, that happens in the Feynman-Dyson derivation as well. Um, and it's one of the reasons why it works. But then, instead of assuming anything else about commutators, I'm going to assume a linkage between the way derivatives work classically and the way they're supposed to work in this situation. And that linkage is this. I'm going to assume that the partial derivative with respect to t of f is equal to the f dot minus the sum on i of the partial of the xi dots times the partials with respect to space of the f, the usual advanced calculus formula for the derivative. But here, it's an assumption, right? Because I'm positing this derivative and I'm the, the dot as commutator with the Hamiltonian, if you like, and the other as this. And then I'm defining d by dt by this equation. So instead of defining the E field, which is what Feynman Dyson did, I'm defining the derivative with respect to time, partial derivative with respect to time. The, uh, the, what I get out of that is that instead of defining the, then, then the E field is defined in relation to that, but I've backed up the definition so that I can define the E field in terms of a partial derivative. And you'll see that there's some advantage of this, okay? But what it involves is working with a constraint between ordinary calculus and the non-commutative world. And there's a, there's a, this can be investigated in a lot of ways, which I won't talk about because we're out of time, but that's the way this derivation works. And um, just to show you what, well, this is the result, and I'll show you one piece of it. So the result is that um, if you define b this way and e this way, then this follows. This is no longer assumed. This follows. Um, the divergence of b is 0. Um, and then you get a b cross b term, which probably, if you were to work out exactly how this goes to the electromagnetism or gauge theory um, in the classical case, will vanish. Um, but it doesn't vanish here. Um, and you get uh, a term involving a current for the other Maxwell equation. So that's my uh, generalization of this. That's the way it looks. Um, I'm just going to give you a, a two-minute vignette about how the derivation works. I like to use the epsilon identity. This is the epsilon identity. It says that epsilon ABI multiplied by epsilon ICD, summed on I, 1 and 2, or 2 and 3, um, is going to be equal to uh, a delta and another delta, or cross deltas. So for example, if this was 1 and that was 2 and this was 3, it wouldn't be non-zero unless this was 3, so there'd only be one term. And then if this was 1 and this was 2, 1, 2, 1, 2, then this would be negative, right? Because you'd have 1, you'd have 1, 3, 2, and here you'd have 1, 2, 3. Be negative. Over here, 1 and 1, 2 and 2, negative. So it's a little switching operation. You can take two deltas, that two, two epsilons that are tied together like that, and you can open them up in parallel and you get minus, or you can cross them and you get plus. And then you can use that to do all sorts of identities. I see I'm running out of time here, so I think I'll stop at this point and tell you that it all works nicely and diagrammatically by using the epsilon identity to verify all of that that I was showing you. Um, you have to follow it through. Um, and for example, uh, a derivation about uh, the x double dot will end up having this kind of shape, where you put in the definition where this, this represents an index, 
and then you, um, then you play with the uh, epsilon identity and rewrite things, and you find yourself with the results that you want. And it's um, a lot of fun to do the derivations in this form. Um, and this is the derivation that gets you uh, over to the um, acceleration formula, the Lorentz force formula. And uh, I'll stop at that point. The main point being that you can formulate, uh, you can formulate non-commutative worlds, do calculus in them, do physics in them. Lots of physics appears there um, in a somewhat transfigured form. And then you're asking, how did it relate to the original world? And one way to, re to relate it to the original world is to take a limit. Another way to relate it to the original world is to try to ask the calculus to look more and more like the calculus in the original world. And when you do that, when you put in those constraints, then it seems that you get more physics coming out than you did before. And what the how that will eventually play out, it's not entirely clear because when you put more constraints on, the algebra gets quite complicated. So one is left with certain technical problems that bedevil one. I'll stop there. <laughs>